This is the second lecture of Unit 2, and in this lecture we're going to be looking at how materials move into and out of cells, across and through membranes in the body. Remember from biology that the cell membrane acts as a barrier to protect the internal contents of a cell from any infections and other harmful objects that are within the internal, in, pardon me, within the external environment. The cell membrane is selectively permeable, which means that it allows some materials to come in and out and it blocks or prevents the access of others. Usually that is determined by the size of the object and whether or not it has a charge. For larger substances um, or charged substances, many times there's energy required, so the cell has to pay, basically, in order to get those materials in or out of the cell. The larger the substance or the more charge there is, usually the more energy is required. Some of the mechanisms that allow for substances to move without any energy requirements are called passive. So passive means no energy. So these are for very small and very neutral substances. Things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, water. Those are some examples. Um, the most straightforward mechanism for materials to move in and out of a cells is diffusion. So this is our first passive mechanism. Diffusion is the process from, from substances moving from when the, where there is a lot to where there is little. So the movement is always from high to low. So if we have a lot of water, or pardon me, let's say a lot of oxygen in one environment and relatively little oxygen, inside the cell, then oxygen will want to move into the cell because it is high on the outside and low on the inside. That difference in oxygen levels is called a concentration gradient. So concentration is how much of something there is, and gradient means there's a difference between two locations. So we see diffusion happening all the time when you turn, say, a heater on at your house, right near the heater or near the fireplace or near the furnace. It's very, very warm, where maybe all the way across the room it's a lot colder. It takes a while for the heat to get from where there is a lot and spread out to where there is very little. The purpose of diffusion is to find a state of equilibrium. The substances and molecules inside the body want to be balanced. They want to have an equal number inside and outside. So equal levels is always the goal. So if a cell membrane is permeable, it has openings that will fit a substance, and there's a difference inside the cell and outside the cell, then diffusion will happen naturally. So a really common example of this in your body is the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So outside the body in the air, there's about a 20% oxygen level. Inside your body, let's say, well, you're going to be a girl here because dresses are easier to draw. Inside your body, there's a relatively low level of oxygen, let's say maybe just 5%. So every time you breathe in, oxygen goes in your mouth, into your lungs, and some of that stays inside the lung tissue and gets absorbed by your bloodstream. Then the oxygen moves into the blood, it gets carried around the body, and wherever it gets to muscle tissue or other cells that are even lower in concentration, the oxygen will move into those cells. And then the cells can use that oxygen for uh, activity like metabolism. The reverse is also true. The body is constantly breathing out carbon dioxide because there's a high level inside the body. Every time you breathe oxygen in, we also release carbon dioxide back out. That is a passive process. This, the body doesn't have to do any work in order for oxygen and carbon dioxide to move in and out of cells. The second passive mechanism is called facilitated diffusion. So this is for medium and neutral particles, so medium size, but still no charge, substances like glucose. Glucose can also come in and out of cells relatively easily, it, but it's too large to fit through small pores. Oxygen is a tiny molecule. It can fit through tiny little openings that are natural to the cell membrane, 
Glucose is not like that. Glucose is slightly larger, so it can't fit through those tiny openings. It needs slightly larger openings. Think about maybe a doorway getting into and out of a classroom rather than a window, right? You can get some things in and out of the window, but for more larger items, you need to have an actual doorway. So I wanna to go to the next slide and I'll show you what this looks like. This is a picture of, let's say these little boxes are glucose and the glucose is going into and out of the cell membrane. So here is the cell membrane and these are little protein channels. They actually kind of look like little doorways. So when glucose is on the outside of the cell and it comes up to the protein channel, there's a little um, binding site that is just the right size for the glucose that tells the protein to kind of shift its shape so that the glucose can move inward and eventually all the way across the cell membrane and then the protein channel goes back to its original shape. So this is a really easy process. The cell doesn't have to pay or use any energy, but it does have to have doorways that are specific to each molecule. The final type of passive transport is osmosis. Osmosis is exactly the same as diffusion, so it's for small molecules that are neutral, and it is for just one molecule in particular, and that one molecule is water. So the, osmosis is the diffusion of water from where there is a lot to where there is little and it goes across the membrane. So from one side of the cell where there is a lot of water to the other side of the cell where there is less water. Water moves back and forth across the membrane all the time, trying to keep the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell in balance. When it moves is dependent upon the pressure. If there is low water, the cell feels high pressure to get more. So think about when you are really thirsty or really dehydrated, you feel this internal pressure to get water. You want something to drink. That in, in a cell, that's called osmotic pressure. It's feeling the pressure to get more water. When the cell is in perfect balance, that is called isotonic. So iso means equal, tonic means tension. That means there's an equal amount of pressure for water on both sides of the membrane because the water balance is equal. Of course, if the balance is our final goal, then what is it called when the cell is not in balance? There's two kind of ways for the cell to be out of balance. If the cell has little water, which means it would have high pressure, that's called hypertonic. Think of high and hyper being together. So high pressure is a hypertonic cell, high pressure. If the cell has very little pressure, so it has all the water it needs, it feels no pressure to get more, that is called hypotonic, low pressure or under the normal level of osmotic pressure. And um, the nice thing about osmosis is water moves really, really easily and really pretty quickly, so the cell can regain its balance in a very small period of time. Okay, we are going to move on to the movement of materials that are either large or charged. So they are either positive or negative, or they are very, very big. In order to move those materials, we need energy. And the use of energy is an active process, so we call this active transport. The other big difference between passive transport and active transport, the first difference obviously is the use of energy. The second difference is the concentration type. So with active transport, we're moving things from where there's relatively little to where there's relatively a lot, which doesn't make sense. If you already have a whole bunch of this one molecule inside the cell, why in the world would the cell want to get more of it? Usually active transport in that case is involving electricity. So in order for our nerves and our muscles to communicate, there has to be an electrical current and in order for an electrical current, we need to move charged particles around. Whenever we moved, move charged particles, that causes an electrical um, current to occur, and that allows the cells to communicate um, using nerve action. 
So if we need to move ions, for example, in or out of cells, we use active transport, and we use a particular kind of protein called an ion pump. I should say ion pump. So just like the protein hallway that I showed you a minute ago with facilitated diffusion, ions move through a special kind of protein, but it is in a slightly different shape. So I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. Once the ions move through the membrane, then the protein returns to its original shape and it sits and waits in the cell membrane for the next time that energy is required and that the cell needs to conduct electricity, for example. Not all pumps are ion-based pumps. Here's some examples of ion pumps, sodium, calcium, hydrogen, potassium. But we can also move larger uh, neutral substances like amino acids through a protein pump. So if we had a, a relatively large substance that needed to get from the outside of the membrane to the inside, let's say the cell needs to make protein for hair, for example, it needs the building blocks to do that, and so it has to bring those building blocks into the cell. And so it does so using a protein pump. So here is our protein pump in the middle of this slide. You can see that there is some color coding here. Our sodium ions are in yellow, and our potassium ions are in purple. So these are two different charged particles that need to move across the cell membrane. So here you can see that we have high potassium on the inside of the cell, and here you can see we have high sodium on the outside of the cell. So we are going to move materials from where there is little to where there is a lot, and we are going to do it using energy. So in order to move materials, we have to have this pump. And so what happens is we get these potassium ions from the outside, where there's not very many. There's only one, two, three. And we're going to move them toward the inside. At the exact same time, we're going to take sodium ions from where there is very little, one, two, three, and we're going to move them to the outside. The way that the pump works is it can move two different kinds of ions at the same time. So it basically rotates like this. As one group of ions goes out, a different group comes in. And that's why it's called a pump. It rotates in kind of a pumping action. Okay, these are our last two examples of active transport. So example two and example three. These are um, opposites of one another, and these two processes, endocytosis and exocytosis, move materials in and out of the cell without them actually crossing the membrane, which is a pretty nifty trick. The way that these two processes work, in endocytosis brings materials in, so this is usually food, and exocytosis sends things out which is usually waste, right? Just like you, you take food in one end and you pass waste out the other end. So there are two kinds of molecules that the cell would usually bring in as food. It might bring in things that are liquid, which is a process called pinocytosis. So usually it's water with dissolved substances in it, and those dissolved substances are big enough that they can't fit through the membrane on their own. And the other type of molecule is larger food molecules, and that process is called phagocytosis. So they're similar processes, but one is for solids and one is for liquids. Let me show you what that looks like. So this is an example of phagocytosis, but pinocytosis looks basically the same. We would just have a larger water bath here and this would be dissolved more. So what happens here is the, the large molecule, let's say a food of some kind, comes up to the surface of the cell and clearly it is way too big to fit across that membrane. So what happens is the membrane basically surrounds the food, it forms this pocket, and then eventually these two sides of the pocket come together and close and it sucks the food in and now this food has its own little membrane around it. That membrane fills up with digestive enzymes 
it breaks down the food and then these teeny tiny food particles get kicked out of the membrane inside the cell for the cell to use. The exact opposite occurs when the cell needs to get rid of waste. So now it's eaten all the food and it's created these waste, basically bubbles, they're called vesicles, but these little waste pockets. So that waste pocket cruises along till it reaches the end of the cell or the side of the cell and basically the membrane of the food pocket fuses with the membrane of the cell and it absorbs and now all of a sudden the contents of the cell are kicked out into the environment around the cell to be picked up by the blood and taken away by the body. So because these materials are going from the inside to the outside, that is an exit process, right? So this process is called exocytosis. All right, there was a lot going on in this lecture, and I am sure you have questions, which is fantastic. So make sure you bring two to three discussion questions to our next class, and I will see you then.